Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, we are back here for our Space 8 Varsity Masterclass. Today is the very last masterclass for this semester anyways. Uh, so far we've heard about designing for competition, we've heard about creative engineering, we have heard about uh, high performance teams, and uh, what else have we done? UI and UX. We've done uh, covered lots of different bases, lots of different subjects. And today we are here at uh, University College London, and we've been splitting our time between UCL and the University of Greenwich as well to, to basically do these master classes. I'm going to do one quick thing before we start, and then I'll be right back. It's distracting. <laughs> All right, and we are back. So basically, these master classes were designed uh, to try to get in touch with you guys, with students. Uh, we thought, you know, we have so much talent in our studio, and we'd really like to share it with everyone else out there. So that is what we're doing. So today we're here at UCL. Uh, we've got some people here who are going to be able to ask questions. And then, of course, you guys on Twitch can ask questions as well. Today we're going to be talking about communities. Um, I'll talk a lot about content as well and content as a bridge um, and bridging, bridging the gaps between communities through content and through good community management. Um, what else? After today's lesson, we're actually going to have a social here at UCL. So if you happen to be in London, you're welcome to uh, pop on down. We're going to be at Gordon House at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have some beers and some snacks and, and generally hang out. Some of the speakers from earlier lectures will be here as well. So um, I've also got some people helping me out behind the scenes, because usually I'm behind the scenes, but today I'm here. So Pablo's going to help out with Q&A later on during, during the show, I guess. So I might as well kick it off and chat about communities. So today's lecture is called, like I said, Bridging the Gap. I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, I uh, basically head up content at Space Ape Games. I'm a journalist by background. I've been in the industry for more than half a decade. I was in, in print and in TV and radio and um, basically used some of those skills to go into community management afterwards. So I, uh, I used to work for Xbox when I first got into the gaming industry for something called Upload, which is like the uh, video sharing and editing platform that launched with the Xbox One. And we were there to, to try to build the community. We were curating content on the platform. And we would also go to shows and conferences and take people from the community with us so that they could talk to, uh, to the devs that were making their favorite games. And I also got involved uh, with eSports back at Xbox. We would do um, like community tournaments and, and go to um, uh, go to competitions and talk to the players and that kind of thing as well. Uh, so yeah, like I said, now I'm at Space Ape. Down there in the corner, you can see uh, myself with Pablo, who did the uh, lecture on high performance teams. Uh, we do a lot of community stuff together. Uh, and I'll just get a close up of that picture because I think it's funny. We were doing something for the wider community, actually. Uh, we were gathering toys from our studio, Transformers toys. We had a bunch of them. And we figured we would share them with a local charity. So that's what we did. But unfortunately, somebody snapped a picture of us between takes. And we look like we're dead inside. And I thought that was kind of funny because uh, you know we're doing something with children's, children's toys, but I looked dead inside. <laughs> Uh, then this is sort of the highlight, I think, of my community management career, if you will. Um, this is Faye. She is a character from Rival Kingdoms. And um, yeah, she came out earlier this year, around Valentine's Day, actually. So that was pretty special for me that I got to be immortalized in one of our games. That was really cool. And I also got a very um, sort of well-rounded backstory, because I was obsessed with one of the characters named Brander. In the, uh, in the game. And so they, they wrote a whole backstory around myself and Brander for the release of Faye, which was very cool. So today, what are we going to chat about? Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about who we are as a studio. Um, I'll talk about community and what good looks like in a community. Um, I'll talk, talk to you about our community and how we build it, how we maintain our community, how we grow it. Um, and what, you know, what community means to us at Space Ape as well. Um, I'll talk about content as a bridge. I've mentioned that before. And we'll also go over some tips for you guys if you're interested in community management um, or getting into the games industry in general. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely chat about that. And of course, we can do Q&A for that as well. So if you've got questions, you can throw them into chat. There's people, people ready to take them. 
So who are we as a studio? Uh, we are a mobile first studio, which means that all of our games are mobile titles. And uh, we don't try to sort of adapt games for mobile. We try to make games that, are, um, that really flourish on mobile and are intended for that platform. So we've been around for about six years now. We were founded with about 11 people. Um, but in that time, or over the last six years, we've actually grown to more than 110 people. Hey, how's it going? Welcome. <laughs> New arrival. Um, and we are actually from 28 different nationalities in the studio, so we're really, really multicultural, which is, which is pretty awesome. And that also helps us service the community better, who are, of course, also multicultural. So to date, we've got uh, four live games. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got uh, Samurai Siege, Rival Kingdoms, Transformers Earth Wars, and um, Fastlane Road to Revenge. So the first three are build and battle titles, and that's sort of how we made a name for ourselves uh, within that genre, but then uh, started to expand outwards. The last one was an arcade shooter. And really, most of our time now is dedicated towards um, trying to define new genres and developing and prototyping new titles. And uh, from what you can see in the corner there, we're sort of, our studio's mixed, a good mix between, you know, like really, really in-depth knowledge, but also we have, we have a lot of fun in the studio. There's some weird broom thing we did for someone's birthday. <laughs> So, um, uh, like I said, most of our time is now spent on, on trying to find new games and uh, try to define new genres in that space. And we also partnered with Supercell last year, which we're uh, pretty excited about because they, as a studio, have quite a similar ethos to us when we're developing games. We're all about small, empowered teams um, and really trying to come up with lots of ideas and then only letting the best ones go through in the end. So. That is us. So what does good look like when we are talking about community? Uh, there are some common traits among communities, you know, whether you are within a gaming community or whether you're in a community in general. Uh, and some of those things are belonging, boundaries, commitment, and sacrifice. And I'll just go through uh, what, what those mean. So belonging. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you're part of a community, um, that means that you belong to something bigger than yourself. You know, it, it makes you feel accepted and you feel like you have more of a purpose within that community than you would if you were just on your own. So if you're uh, in a gaming community, obviously that's, that's what that would feel like. And uh, you know, if you're in our studio, for example, and it's Halloween and you all dress like Where's Waldo, you feel like, or Where's Wally for the UK people as well, then you feel like you're part of that community. But a community also comes with boundaries. So those are certain, like a set of rules and guidelines that you have to adhere to to be able to, to stay a part of that community. So if we take uh, community in the larger sense, for example, you know, you can't go around stealing and killing people uh, because that would go against the rules of the community that we live in. Um, and if you were to go against the rules, then you might get kicked from that community or you might be an outlier, so you don't want to do that. Uh, if we're talking about games, we can t look at Riot, who has a set of guidelines not only for their players, like the like the honor system. So if you're you know if you're good to your players, if you if you respect each other, if you do well in the game, you can level up and get more rewards. Um, but also for <clears throat> but also for the employees that work there, they have a manifesto that they have to adhere to to be part of that community. Commitment. Um, so basically, if you're a part of a community, you sometimes have to sacrifice things about yourself. You are not working in a vacuum anymore. You're sort of working towards a common goal, and it's all about the greater good. So if you are committed, uh, that means that maybe you have to sacrifice an evening out uh, and make sure that you're playing with your alliance in a kingdom raid or something like that, because otherwise you might get booted if you're not committed enough. And commitment and sacrifice kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, there are lots of times when, when we're doing uh, our live streams, for example, and we'll get people sitting in chat saying, oh, I really want to be here, but OK, I've been here for half an hour. Now I have, to, I have to run away. I have to jet, because otherwise my significant other is going to kill me. Like, I spend too much time here. And the fact that they were there in the first place, like, that's commitment. And um, sometimes you have to, yeah, you sacrifice maybe a date with your significant other because you really want to play the game, unless you're this couple, uh, in which case you can do both, you know, both at the same time. <laughs> So uh, another part of what good looks like is communication. You really can't have a community unless you're communicating. And this is where we can employ some of our journalistic principles of the who, what, when, where, and why. So what does that mean? 
the who. Uh, that means who are you communicating with when you are talking to your players. You might not always be talking to all of your players. Sometimes you're talking to your elder players. Sometimes you're talking to new people just coming into the game. And depending on who you're talking to, you're going to have to tailor your language, tailor your messaging, tailor the way that you communicate. So what? What is it that you are trying to communicate to your players? You know, is it um, just an update that's happening in the game? There's a new character release, or is it uh, you know an important bug fix that you need to communicate to all of your players? Um, is it about rewards in the game? So different things that you you um, you tell your players. It it depends what you're t talking to them about how you're going to tell them about it. Um, that leads us to when. So how often do you? Do you uh, communicate with your players? How often are you in contact with your players? Uh, and once you find out what the best cadence is to be in touch with that player base, it's good to stick to it. That way they can build expectations around that. Um, and so they always know, for example, OK, a newsletter is going to come out on a Tuesday, so I always know that is when I get my, inform my information. And I can start to structure my, my strategy, for example, for an event around that, because I know I'll get the info and I can share it with the rest of my alliance at that time. And then where? Where are you sharing that information? Different kinds of information obviously have to be communicated on, on different platforms in different ways. So you know, is it uh, a holiday message you're sending to, to your community on Facebook? Or um, is, it, is it like a really important update in the game that everybody should know about? Or are you on, on Twitter with all of your information when actually your whole community is on Twitch and you're totally missing, missing uh, a space where you could be communicating with your player base? And then, uh, yeah, this is similar as well. So yeah, why are you communicating? Like I said, is it, is it just a, a greeting? Or is it, you know, for example, here International Women's Day, a fleeting day that you're only going to post about once? Or is it um, a series of changes that have come to the game? And you need to make sure that you're disseminating that information broadly so all your players know about it. So now I'll talk a little bit about our community and how we built it and how we maintain our community and what community means to us as well. So what does community mean to us? How did we build it? So many different ways. I'm going to go through my notes just to make sure that I don't miss anything, because there have been a lot of different ways that we've worked on building out our community, for sure. So one of those ways, let's go through that. So one of those ways is events. We hold weekly events. Uh, we, like to, we like to say that we're really good at live ops, which means that once we release a game, it's really just the beginning of that game's life cycle. We make sure that our games become a service so that players will stay around for a long time and they can um, have a place to play with, with their teammates. And really, community is about making sure that your players have a space and a place to congregate and rally around something together, which is why we hold these weekly events, where they can come together, they can battle it out, they can meet each other. Um, there's also, uh, we have chat in all of our games so that the community can organize around those things. We have news feeds that go out in our games um, at different intervals throughout the week to let people know what's coming up whether, uh, about that event or anything else that's happening in the game. And then um, we also have newsletters that go to, to different sections of players depending on their level in the game and what information they might need to know. And then, as well, we also create a lot of content to make sure that we're always engaging with our community. And I'll talk more about content in a little bit. Um, along, along with that as well, we have uh, lots of different agents who work in many different languages. I think we cater to about 12 nationalities now uh, in our games to make sure that everybody has a level playing field and, get, and that everybody's getting uh, the same information, uh, whether they speak English or Spanish or German, uh, you can still enjoy our game because somebody will be there to be able to answer your questions and cater to you as well. And then, like I said, content, we do make lots of uh, tutorials, for example, and walkthroughs if there are new gameplay features that are being released that need more explanation. Uh, we make sure that we're, we're catering to our players that way as well. And of course, live streams like this one. Um, we love live streaming. It's really um, a great way to be able to interact uh, with your community directly. And so we find that's really important. We'll talk a bit more about that in a little bit, too. Uh, next up, Oop. what does community mean to us? Let me find my, my notes. Um, 
Oh, I lost my, oh, sorry, who does it encompass? I lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, so yeah, who does our community encompass? It is a really, really, really broad spectrum. We have like 35 million players from all over the world, and that is really far ranging from, you know, stay-at-home moms to CEOs to NASA engineers, OBEs. It's really, it really runs the gamut. And so that means that we really have to be sensitive to the fact that we have, you know, different cultures playing our games, different ages playing our games, and that means we have to cater to those people accordingly. And not only that, but as a developer, it's really important for us to realize that you guys are spending your time in, in our game. For us, or for, for a developer, I think it's important to realize that time is the most precious thing that you guys can actually give. I mean, forget you know, spending money on a game. You could be doing a million other things with your time, and you could be playing a million other games during that time, but you've chosen to play our game. So as a developer, I think that means we have to humble ourselves and respect that and make sure that we are, uh, we are taking care of our community because you're giving us your time. So of course, we like to... Um, you know, build places where players can not only meet each other, so for example, we hold player meetups, um, but also where they, can, where they can meet us. And this is a, a really kind of funny example of just how like, special a game can be to a community and why that's so important to take care of that community. But we actually had two people uh, in Rival Kingdoms who met one another through the game, fell in love, and then ended up getting married um, because of that game, which is like amazing, incredible. So for us, we're like, oh, we need to celebrate this somehow. We need to honor that. And so uh, we got a bunch of people from the office to all dress like ancients from the game. Uh, I mean, like badly dressed up ancients, but dressed up nonetheless. And we created this whole sort of ridiculous skit around having been invited to the wedding, but somebody messing up the date of the wedding, and then we missed it. And then this crazy fight ensued. I'm just going to fast forward in the video. You can see the, the really cheesy effects that we added to the video as well. Yeah, there you go. And uh, basically, that was all to, to try to congratulate these two guys, uh, Britt and Robert, who, who got married because of our game. I'll put these away because I don't really need those anymore. So moving on. Oh, they won't let me. One second. Nope. There we go. OK. So how do we maintain that community? Um, so like I said, we do have uh, lots of events that we, that we use. We have live streams. We have content to make sure that our community is always engaged. Um, but what's really important to understand is that different communities have different needs. And different communities need different ways for you to interact with them. So even for, uh, for our games, for example, you know, Rival Kingdoms and Transformers Earth, Earth Wars, for example, have very, very different communities. So for Transformers, you have to understand the motivations for why people are playing your game in order to be able to, to interact with them correctly. So Transformers fans, for example, they play our game not only because you know, they, they, like, uh, they like gameplay and they like fighting in teams, etc., but because they love Transformers. They love the Transformers universe. They love the lore. They love all the characters. And so for them, that game is largely about you know, reliving some of that nostalgia from the G1 cartoon and in collecting those characters. And so if we are creating uh, features or content around that game, we have to be really, really aware to make sure that we have uh, our bases covered as far as research goes and backstory for all the different characters and, and that whole universe. Because if we get that wrong, no matter how cool the character is that we're releasing, if it's not authentic, if it doesn't fit with the universe that they're used to, then they're going to reject it. And we have to be really, really careful with that. Whereas for Rival Kingdoms, for example, you know, that game's been out for, for longer, for a few years now. It has a lot of elder players. And they are really, really focused on strategy. They've worked out the best strategies for different ancients. They know their defenses. And so when we are releasing ancients, they still get excited about the different ancients and different characters that we're releasing. But it's more about what those characters can do as far as their gameplay goes and as far as leveling up their strategy goes. So we have to be really careful when we're communicating, when we're releasing anything for those two different games. Like There are very different motivations behind why people play those games. I need one sip of a drink now, because I've been talking for, for a long time. Chat amongst yourselves. Mm. It's one of the gross green drinks as well. Um, <laughs> no water today. So um, as well for, for being able to manage a community, 
you really have to be up to date on the latest tools to be able to manage that community properly. So for example, when uh, we first launched Rival Kingdoms, we thought, hey, you know what, we want to be able to chat with our community and a lot of the players are online. Uh, obviously really popular chatting tool. And so we thought, okay, let's go meet our community online because that's where they are and that's where we should be, which you know, you think that, that does make sense, but unfortunately online, um, obviously sometimes players don't all get along and they have conflict and online anyone can kick anyone and so or at least at that time anyone could kick anyone and so really that that power should only lie with with you as the developer if you're trying to manage a community rather than having uh, the players kick each other that's not a good experience for them and so we ended up having to switch over to band because it had more robust tooling and more robust administration uh, to, to make sure that we could give them a better experience so yeah, it's always about you know, seeing what's coming, up, what's coming up ahead, making sure you have the right tools, and adapting with your community, because they're going to tell you, they're going to let you know uh, what you need to, to best take care of them. So uh, the last, last part here is getting feedback. And it's about getting feedback and not feeding the trolls. And what I mean by that is you, know, you should let your players inform your decisions. They, have, they usually, at some point, they know the game better than you do yourself. And so they, they catch everything. And you should listen to their feedback. But you have to <clears throat> take into account uh, what they're saying and how they're saying it, how many people are saying it. So for example, is it one player saying, oh, this, you know, this new character sucks and it's too weak now um, because maybe that character was OP before, but you've had to nerf it because it messed with the balance of the game. And now there's one person saying, oh, I hate this character now. You know, you've, you've ruined them. Or is it you know, a dozen players saying, hey, this character doesn't work anymore or I can't use it properly anymore. The abilities have now become useless because maybe we've made another tweak in the game somewhere that has somehow affected that character. And that's something we need to then change and we need to, to, we need to um, incorporate. Um, we also, like I said, we have agents working, uh, working in a bunch of different nationalities and we actually get daily reports about all of our games from the community. So the community will send in feedback to our agents, they will collate all that information and then send out daily reports to all the product teams so that they're always aware of what's going on in the game, what are the pain points, what are the bug fixes that we might need to do. Um, yeah, there's always tons of feedback there. And sometimes, you know, the, the community will tell us what they'd like to see in the game next, and they have some, like, really good ideas. Some things that we've implemented in our games have actually come from the community. So, uh, or sometimes they let us know, uh, you know, we'll let them vote on which characters they'd like to see next or something, and, some, and that happens. That happens a lot of the time. So yeah, feedback, huge. And if you want to know more about balancing that feedback, especially when you're, you know, designing for competition, you should check out Andrew's talk. Because uh, he chatted about designing events and how you can best uh, best sort of balance that and, and when you should be making events that are really hardcore and when you need to lighten the load on your players so they don't burn out. So all of that has to do with, with feedback as well that we get from the players. So that brings me to content. Uh, I love content. Content is, is my thing. Obviously, I've got a long history of content. And content is a bridge. And what I mean by that is that you can use content to reach people. And you can use it to grow your communities and expand to new communities as well. Uh, and content, at least we believe, should always uh, add value. You know, We don't make throwaway content. It should always be used for something. And usually that falls into one of these four buckets, which is awareness, affinity, engagement, and information. And I'll just go through what those are really quickly. So awareness. Uh, awareness, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Basically means that uh, you know, this is content to let your players know about maybe a new feature that's coming out, um, and some sort of update you're releasing. Maybe it's a bug fix that you've made. And it's just to, to keep people in the know and let them know that something is happening or changing within your game. So here, for example, you know, prime cores were coming out in Transformers, Transformers Earth Wars. We, shot pe we thought people should know about it. We made a video about that. Or here's Simon Furman, who actually writes for Transformers Earth Wars. And he's giving a bit of background on, on the story that we're going to be releasing along with this new feature. Then affinity. And what that means is uh, you're basically building a bond between you yourselves, your de the developers, and, and your community. And, um, 
when you're doing that, you're, you're sort of trying to build trust between, between yourselves. And that means you, know, you should try to let your players see that you're people as well. I mean, your players love your game, and they should be able to see and feel that you love your games as well if they're going to be invested. So we do a lot to try to sort of show that, that we have personality and the things that matter to us as a studio and the things that matter to us uh, in our games. So for example, you know, this is just us saying happy holidays, but we sort of do it in Space Ape style because we're a bit, bit wacky and things. Or uh, sometimes it's also about you know, owning up to things when things go wrong. So we were having a stream and our audio just stopped working for some reason because, I don't know, reasons, as Pablo likes to say. And um, we thought, hey, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do right now. The audio is not working. But actually, one of our coworkers brought his dog in. So let's show them the dog, and let's just talk about the dog for a little while, because at least that's something to look at while we're figuring out the audio. Um, I don't know if the, if the dog was on screen yet or not. Not sure. Was it? Might have missed it. Anyways, there is a dog there in that video. <laughs> Moving on. Information. So this is uh, similar to awareness, but kind of more in depth. So this is when you might be releasing a new game mode, for example, and uh, your, you know, your player base um, needs more information to be able to make use of that new feature or of that game mode. It needs more explanation. And so that's when we create uh, content around um, explaining things like tutorials or walkthroughs so that the players can get the most out of that game. And then uh, last but definitely not least is engagement. So this is obviously a content that is meant to activate and to get you guys to, to participate with, with us and participate in the content that we're making. So you know, we'll have things like, uh, for example, live streams, or we had a, a Soho social where we had a party in the office, and then we had a, um, a competition where <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my voice, man. We had a competition where people from Space Ape were, were fighting against the community in our game. So that was really, really interactive because we kept score while we were going and we could feed back with the community live as well. And that's one of the reasons that I just love live streams is because it's really rare that you get a piece of content to tick all of those boxes. And live streams do that really well. I mean, you can, you know, you can share information. Uh, you can walk, walk through new features uh, really easily. You can have that direct relationship in a Q&A. Uh, you can do all the things that, you know, maybe you can do all four things uh, versus just maybe another piece of content only ticking one of those boxes. So that's really cool. OK, I'm going to take one sip of my, my drink. <laughs> uh, how are we doing for time? Cool. So content is a bridge. Um, and that means that new types of content can help you reach new audiences and new communities. And that's another reason that I love content. So take, for example, this, this class, this master class. It's really possible, it's definitely possible, that some of our arcade players are watching this class uh, because they love the game they want to hear. They want to hear more about maybe tidbits I might talk about, I might mention about that game here in this class. But not only that, you know, it might, just, might not just be RK players. It could be Transformers Earthwars players. It could be Fastlane players because they've heard about our company and they're invested in our company, our studio in general. And so they might tune into this lecture. But it goes further than that um, because it might not just be people who love our games, but people who love games in general who are tuning into this lecture now. Like I'm sure a lot of you guys on Twitch have maybe never picked up one of our games, but you, but you know that, hey, I love games and I love communities. So yeah, I'll, I'll have a listen. I'll, I'll see what's going on. And then even broader than that, it's just people who might not even know about games in general. Maybe they, you know, they, they randomly found this link on Twitch, or they're like, oh, what's Twitch? Let me, let me see what this is about. Or they just like to learn about new industries. And so uh, content has that ability to be able to, to bridge the gap between different kinds of communities and bring everybody under one roof, under one umbrella, which I think is really, really cool. So our new community, which brings me to um, this community that we're building now, is about education. So we really wanted to try to create content that was going to you know, bring value and add value, uh, like I was talking about before, about those different pillars. And we thought that 
education was a great space to do it in because you guys are the ones who are going to be leading our industry. And you never know through these classes and through these interactions who we're going to find. It's totally possible that we find you know, the next whiz kid coder to be able to join our company uh, through doing something like this. And I know for myself, there's a video in the corner there of something called the Hackney Pirates. And that is a literacy group that I volunteer with. And it's younger kids. They're, they're, they're you know, younger than you guys are. But um, yeah, just, I always remembered all of my good teachers growing up, you know, like the ones who would steer you in a different direction or the ones who would call you on your BS or humble you or, uh, or any one of those things. And, uh, and you know, if we can, if we can like, give one tiny bit of that back, like why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we do that? So that is uh, why we're doing these master classes. And we hope to do more in this space, definitely. So before my throat starts to kill me, oh man. Excuse me. Let's talk about how you guys can get into community. If you're interested in community management um, or just the games industry in general, you want to get your foot in the door, you know, how, how can you do that? <clears throat> the thing is, you're probably already doing it now. Re uh, realistically, if you are um, watching on Twitch you're, or you love games, you're probably part of a gaming community. And that means that you have a lot of value that you could bring to a developer. And one of those things is to mod for the game that you love. If you're really passionate about a game, why not make it better? Help make it better. That means not trolling, uh, but modding. So moderating chat, uh, helping other players out. If you're, if you're the one who's always in chat and, and um, you know, giving advice to players or giving insight about the game or trying to be democratic and quell different, different arguments that rise up or even advocate for the players when you think there is something in the game that's really, really unfair. It's totally possible that, hey, you're already doing community management. So, Another one is playtest. So if a company is releasing a new game and they need playtesters, definitely get on board. And then make sure that you provide constructive feedback You know that really lets the developers know that you've thought about the longevity of the game, not only from a player perspective, but from a developer perspective as well. So. Uh, when we're looking for community managers and, and mods and that kind of thing, that's what we look for is, you know, you, you might love the game but you, as a player, but you have to be able to think about what is best for that game, for the longevity of that game from a developer perspective. So if you can do that, um, then we want to see that in a playtest when you're giving feedback. And then, of course, create content. And that means creating content that adds value to that game. So whether it's you know, making tutorials about a new feature to help your fellow players understand how to, to, to best go forward in the game, um, something informative, or if you're just building awareness about an, a new character that you love. Um, we definitely always take note of people who are creating content around our games, and we, and we actually feature them on our uh, social media pages and stuff as well. And then the last one um, for community management specifically is, of course, communication. You have to build up those credentials. So whether you know, you're, you're doing customer service um, on the phone for something, or whether you are managing a sports team or an eSports team, something that's going to show a developer that you have some, some um, background and some skill set in being able to manage different types of personalities uh, for, for problem solving and for the greater good of that community. So before we wrap, uh, here are some classes that we've had this semester. So if you haven't checked out some of these classes before, you should definitely go back and do that. Um, and the first one of those was Creative Engineering 101 with Tom Mejias. He talked about math hacks and rapid prototyping, or sorry, prototyping, rapid development, um, really, really interesting stuff. We had Designing for Competition with Andrew, and he talked a lot about you know, what makes a competitive game tick and what do you have to take in, into consideration as a developer if you want it to function in, in that environment. Uh, game Design for Modern Times, uh, that was Adam. He talked a lot about the building blocks of game design and the different roles that you can find within that space. And then uh, Pablo, who's behind the scenes over here, talked about high performance teams. And that was a really widely applicable talk because he talked about um, you know, the different skill sets that you might, that you might gain in, in being on a high performance team that you could carry over, whether it's your work, your student life, or, or within that team as well. And then last week, not last week, oh wow, yesterday, we had uh, Adam and Lisa talk about UI and UX, which was incredible because they also talked about uh, you know, the psychology behind why, why we uh, identify with certain things in games and why things make sense in games and why they don't and things to keep in mind. So 
very, very cool stuff. So make sure you check out all of those talks. And then of course, today we talked about communities. And you could talk about communities forever. There's so much stuff to talk about, but you know, for, for time's sake and for my throat's sake as well. Uh, so that is it uh, for now. Thanks, thanks everybody. We're going to do some, some Q and A, I think. <laughs> yes, we will do I'm some take another Q &A. Sip of my, of my uh, Yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Do we have any <coughs> questions me. in the audience? Raise your Yes, we have one. <laughs> there you go. Please state your name. Uh, hi, I'm Adrian. Thank you for, hi, for the talk. And uh, I want to ask you about the difference when, uh, when in the communities and building for them, building content for them. When you when you have the the game that was that was raised pr from 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 the beginning in the in the game studio like Rival Kingdoms mm -hmm. and the difference uh, wh when it is the brand that was established already like in Transformers mm -hmm. You mean the difference in managing those communities? Yes, do you have like a freedom in in ideas that that in case of the ah. Transformers, uh, mm. like the the owner gives you the the com complete freedom, where and you can expand the the universe however you want, or you have to like contact Adhere with them. Things. Yeah, from sure. Time. So, <coughs> excuse me, bad. So with Transformers, um, there are definitely there are definitely like guidelines around what we can and cannot do with that game, and that's what I was talking about before. Is what uh, is why that is um, you know like a different community to manage versus Rival Kingdoms, for example. That's our own IP because Transformers comes with like decades of background and history and lore that you really have to be sensitive to because that's been built over years and years and years and that's what people love. So you can't just come in one day and ignore all those things and break that and then you know make up your own stuff. So especially for Transformers, we have to be really, really careful when we're creating new characters that um, you know they're always really close to um, the toy, for example. We always take the toys in Transformers as inspiration for making for making our digital versions of those characters. And there's definitely a lot of back and forth with, ha with Hasbro as well when we're creating those characters. Um, because, yeah, they have to make sure that it fits within that universe and, and not, to, you know, not to cross any of those boundaries. Um, but that being said, like, we do get a lot of leeway in the type of content that we can make, for example, for that game. Um, <clears throat> so at first, we had like, a quite robust approval process in place uh, with Hasbro whenever we were making any type of content um, that they would sign off and say, OK, no, this is OK, this is not, this doesn't really fit with the brand, et cetera. Um, but because the game's been out for, I think, like two years now, they really trust us with the stuff that we make because they've seen over those two years like how much our team is like obsessed with with this game as well and making sure that you know um, we give the best experience to our players and really like take care of that brand because people people are in love with it and you have to like be sensitive to that so now we have a lot of freedom in in the type of content that we're allowed to produce because they've seen that we you know we do it justice and we don't take that for granted so it really it really depends no, sure. Any other question in the audience? <laughs> so we have some from the stream itself. Sure. Um, Psycholo Geeks is asking. It's always my favorite, the names. Yes, <laughs> the names <laughs> are, uh, they are tricky. Yeah. How, how you guys handle trolls slash toxic people in the community? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that goes back a little bit to what I was saying about you know getting feedback but not feeding the trolls. It is really like natural that people are going to troll you or troll your game. It's just the, the nature of the beast, right? You can't really avoid it. Um, but what I will say is with trolls, like you, you just you don't, you don't give them any, any um, what's the word I'm looking for? I lost my brain here for a second. You don't give them any attention because that's often what they're looking for. Like they just want their, their voice to be heard somewhere and so, and so they're, they're making a ruckus. And so um, yeah, with trolls, you generally just ignore them. That's the best thing you can do with them because the second you start to get defensive about something you're saying, it's like you're hooked and then it's over. So, uh, but you have to find out as well if like they're trolling for a reason, like maybe it's a valid concern. It's really important as a developer to not just listen to good feedback, of course, because that usually doesn't make your game better. It's really appreciated and it's awesome to hear when people love your game, but the most uh, like useful feedback is when it's like constructive criticism. So if they're trolling 
something that is um, basically warranted, then you have to listen to that as well. Although I do find as well, one more thing on trolls, is sometimes you can turn trolls into your advocates. Because like I said, like sometimes they just want to be listened to. And if you, if you take the time to, to engage with them and say like, OK, what, what is it that, that we could be doing better? Sometimes those people will completely change their tune and completely flip and, and end up being advocates and evangelists for your game just because you, know, you gave them the time of day. So. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's twofold, I think. I think a lot of community management is about um, listening. And when your community feels like they're being listened to and they're heard, even if you can't address all of their concerns or address all the problems, because sometimes you can't, um, that's, that's the biggest thing, for sure. All righty. <coughs> we have me. some more over here. <laughs> sure. So how important it is to embrace every social media platform? Are some social media platforms better for mobile gaming than others? Hmm. Uh, I think it really depends on your game uh, regarding social media platforms. I mean, we're definitely always going to be on, on Facebook and Twitter just because they have established communities that you can easily reach out to. Um, YouTube as well, because we make a lot of content. Uh, Twitch, of course, because I mean, I've gone on and on about live streams already. Um, but there might be some social media platforms that are more suited to, to your game than others. So for example, if you've got um, a game that's really uh, like concept art heavy, or just in general, the world is fascinating, like you're probably going to want to be on Instagram, because you can share all of those different um, art pieces on that platform, probably a lot more effectively than on something like Twitter, where it's going to be in like a race and after, after you know, five seconds when it gets buried. So I think it depends on your game. As well with, um, uh, with our games, for example, we do Instagram, I think, for Transformers because of the, that history that I mentioned and that lore and um, the progression of the characters that we can show. Whereas for Rival Kingdoms, less so because uh, people don't have that that like base and that understanding with that universe, so they would be less interested in maybe seeing like the artwork behind it. All right. <coughs> so there's there's more. Here's one. <laughs> Is there any difference between building communities on mobile and console? Is there a difference? Uh, yeah, I've thought about that before. I've been asked that before. A little bit. So I think when I was at Xbox, um, it was maybe a little different because just console and mobile are different types of games. So for console, you know, you, you make a game and then you release it and set it out into the wild and then you sort of deal, deal with it after. There's not like a lot you can do once it's released, like it's done. Whereas with mobile, like I said, it's like a living, breathing service. So we're constantly iterating on our games and changing things within our games. And so that means that the community management of that game is just, it starts the second it's released. Um, so whereas with console, you know, you have, say, like Call of Duty out for a year, and then you have a different game out the year after, or like a different iteration of the game. And so like the community management there is different than, than for our games because it's just our game is constantly changing. Like every month or every t two weeks, there will be some sort of update that you need to communicate to the community and that they'll have feedback on for the developer. Like we're constantly uh, in, in, constant, in a constant feedback loop, sorry, with our community. So it is, it is different. I think with console, you can sort of, especially for content and stuff as well, you can create it and just let it, <laughs> let it fly out. Into the into the ether, whereas for for mobile, it's like a like a loop. It's much more interactive. I find way more, yeah, way more interactive in mobile. I mean, if it's important to you, your community, which it is for us. So. Alrighty, so another one: mm -hmm. esports build communities or communities build esports. <laughs> um, esports builds communities. Both. Um, I mean, I think at the heart of it the community decides whether a title is going to be an eSport. Like, you cannot, as a developer, say, this is going to be an eSport. You can give it the best chance for success in that space, of course. Uh, you know, so making sure that you know, it has a skill cap and, and it's really watchable, um, making sure that you're, you're elevating people who are becoming evangelists or like to shoutcast in your game, etc. Making sure it's really, really competitive uh, and creating that environment. But you can't ever say it's going to be an eSport. It doesn't become an eSport until 
people love it enough to want to watch it all the time, and you sort of hit, hit that critical mass. So I think communities, yeah, communities build esports because they're the ones who decide if something's going to be an esport. But that being said, I think so many people have come into like into games and this whole industry because of esports. I think um, it like esports. <clears throat> as an industry is building all different types of communities that are not just focused around one particular game, but around, uh, like I said, like that industry, that space as a whole. So I don't think it's, uh, yeah, it, I, don't, I think it's both. I think it's both. Cool. If there's any question in the audience, just raise your hand. Oh, okay. There's one. <laughs> there you go. I believe sometimes even if you create constantly content, the community uh, communities can f start falling apart. How 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 do you deal with that? How, I'm not sure if you ever had that that kind of situation, but <coughs> do you know Excuse how me. how in other companies, for example, they're trying to to deal with with this kind of situation? So when communities try to leave you, <laughs> yeah, basically, or they are not as they're not as, as, as interested they as they to used be. to be. Maybe there is coming a new game that is stealing, like PUBG yeah. on mobile in in US yeah. now, or, or something like this. No, oh, yeah, that definitely happens. Um, which is why you always have to be like on it as a as a community manager. You can't ever really let your guard down. I think, like you said, especially in the mobile space, if you let your guard down, another game could either you know take your players, or your players will get distracted and go somewhere else. So they don't feel like they're being cared for. You're, why should they stick around realistically, right? So, um, I think for us, it's really important that we're that we're always on it. Like you just. You have to make sure you're always listening, giving back, but also be conscious of the fact that your community will change over time. So you have to cater to them differently. So for example, when um, we first started doing live streams for Rival Kingdoms, for example, you know, a lot of the players were new and they just wanted to um, like A, figure out like what is this game? Who are you as a developer? What do I do in this game? What can I do in this game? Um, so it was a lot more um, I guess like informative in the beginning uh, in that sense it's just sort of like a, an overall catch-all whereas now like three years later when we have live streams like it's like the hardcore elder players who are in that stream so they're not going to want to know anything you know anything basic about that title they're going to want to know like all the minutiae about um, balancing and how they can employ the best strategies. Like they will know that game better than you do. And if you've made a mistake in balancing or math, they will literally pull up a spreadsheet and say like, actually, I've done this math and this is incorrect. And like that happens. We get screenshots of spreadsheets where they've done the math. So um, it's being really aware that, yeah, like your communities will change and alter over time and you have to stay, stay at pace with them. Otherwise, you're going to lose them for sure. Okay, uh, another one from Twitch. How do you balance allowing feedback from the community to lead your roadmap and giving them too much power of the game's future? Uh, sorry, how do you how do you not let them to? Yeah. <laughs> how do you not let them to? Um, yeah, like I said, it's a it's a balancing act. You definitely want to uh, make sure your players feel like they're heard, and sometimes they have really good ideas, like I said, for, for your game as well, so implementing that. But you can't um, let them steamroll you either, because at the end of the day, you have more um, <clears throat> like more in-depth like visibility over what makes your game good. So while somebody in the community might say, um, Oh, you know, like this this event was like way too hard, and um, you know, like we had to grind too much to get there, and, and we really, really hated this event. Um, and you might take that feedback and be like, okay, listening, but take it with a grain of salt because you know that when you ran a similar event and it was easier, people like churned and didn't enjoy it as much because there wasn't enough of um, like a comp competitive element there for them. So you do have to um, always balance what the community is saying with what you know uh, on your side as a developer and like check it with data. So if people are saying, oh, this was this is way too hard and we hated it, but your participation rate is way higher on that event than it was on the easier one, then you probably have, you know, you probably have your answer there as well. Um, 
have true about influences. So how <laughs> important are influences when building communities? Yes, uh, very important. I think um, the term influencer has like, it's like changes all the time, right? Um, so I think for us, like influencers are not only maybe uh, like YouTubers or celebrities, etc., but like they're people who play your game a lot and love your game and will evangelize for your game. That could be just a regular player as well who is good at uh, rallying, rallying the rest of the community. So super, super important. Um, definitely. I mean, they can, uh, speaking of like content and reach, they can create a piece of content that could reach a completely different set of people that you might otherwise reach uh, and get them introduced to your game, to your company. Um, so, so really, really important, really valuable. Yeah. But it's also important that if you are working with influencers that you find the right fit. I don't think it's ever about, you know, paying somebody to make a video and then hoping your game blows up like that's really, really naive. <laughs> I think you have to find people who genuinely love your game or your product and then um, using those people as evangelists, whether they're a player, an influencer, or a celebrity, whatever it may be. Like it, you can always, always spot in authenticity. If people are fake about your game or you liking your game, like you can tell. So it's not worth it. Okay, and another one about influencers, <laughs> although it's not really mentioned. Um, Fastlane <coughs> basically embraced the YouTube mm. community and actually incorporated to the game. So how difficult was that to bring about? Uh, well, our, uh, our head of uh, influencer marketing, Jody, would be the best person to talk about that. And I firsthand saw the, uh, the late nights and the stress and the struggle that she had in, in just trying to get all of that together. I mean, you can imagine like YouTubers, they have so many different, like they're different personality types, um, different types of content that they make and trying to, to wrangle all these different, um, these different sides and get them, get them under one roof and all collaborating on the same thing. Like it was really, really difficult. Um, not because, you know, people didn't want to do it, but just to make sure that everybody was, um, was really invested and that all the content was really tailored, like within the game, like all the events um, were all tailored to that specific personality. So, um, you know, like Jelly, for example, I think he lost his hair gel. Like it was, it was just very, very specific and tailored to each YouTuber to make sure that, you know, you were highlighting the best of that person and also making sure that, um, yeah, they felt like they were unique in the game. So it was, it was a lot of work. That it was a lot of work, but definitely worth it. Okay, another one. So how important is localization for a mobile game community? And I will mm. add something else from my personal uh, <laughs> brew. Sure. Um, how important is also to, dis to, to basically dissect those communities in different languages, ah. saying like mm. English, Spanish, yeah. Yeah, um, super important. Uh, so our uh, localization manager is Kidong, and he has spent the last, you know, three, four years like perfecting localization at Space Ape. He does an incredible job and he's always, I was talking about tools before, he's always looking for the latest like tools and uh, administrative things that he can use to make sure our localization is on point. And like I said, it's really important for us because we want to make sure that everybody across the world can engage with our games in the same way. Uh, that doesn't mean like um, you, like you said, public, it doesn't mean you necessarily service everything the exact same way, but you want to make sure everybody comes away with a really good experience. So for us, localization is huge, and uh, we have agents in, in like yeah, like I said, a dozen different languages to make sure that that happens. And like you said, uh, for for catering to different you know uh, cultural sensitivities, etc. Like for myself, for example, I was a German community manager when I first started, and we were making. Um, like country specific ancients. So, uh, which I showed you before, Brander, that was like the German specific ancient. And he had a backstory that, um, you know, that German people would, would identify with. They would recognize um, some, some aspects of his backstory and of that mythology in one of their own local uh, sort of mythological heroes. And you need that kind of detail to be able to speak to different uh, cultures if you want to engage those people, you know, or for, for Chinese New Year, we, we did something specific. And um, yeah, so, so definitely, definitely really important. And you can't do like a one size fits all blanket covers everything. 
uh, you have to have to be tuned to that for sure. Well, that will be all all the questions. Okay, cool. So what time is it? Anyway? <laughs> it's five two. Ah, yes. cool. All right. Well, uh, with that being said, thanks so much for all of your guys' questions. Really appreciate it. So for this uh, varsity program, like I said, this is our first, uh, this is sort of like the pilot series, our first semester doing these classes. We definitely want to do more of them. And we would love your feedback on you know, the types of uh, topics that you guys would find interesting for us to cover. Uh, we really want your feedback. So I think the, the email might have been on the screen before. Uh, varsity at spaceapegames.com. We'd love to, to hear from you guys. Uh, we'll look to do more classes uh, in the fall as well. So uh, we'll be planning out those sessions over the next few months. So yeah, definitely want your feedback for that. Like I said, you can uh, go back and watch the other classes as well uh, on game design, on competitive design, on creative engineering, on teams, on UI, UX. Uh, there's some really, really good stuff in there. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been talking for a long time. and. Um, We'll also be re-airing these sessions, actually, with live Q&A. So I know that the Q&A bit is often like the most uh, compelling part of these. So if you guys have more questions about you know, getting into the industry, specifics about a particular role, um, we will have people who, uh, who know about that specific uh, topic sitting in the chat to be able to answer your questions, or even the speakers who gave the lecture uh, as well. So that is the plan. We'll also have all the presentations available on uh, our blog starting, I'll probably do that this week or early next week. You'll be able to find them all there. So if you don't want to listen to an hour of somebody talking, you can go through the slides as well. Um, <clears throat> and then after this, like I said, tonight we're going to have a little bit of a social with some, some beer and snacks and stuff here at UCL. So if you're for some reason not here but around the corner and you want to come join us, that'll be at Gordon House. Uh, so come join us there. But yeah, if you are an educational institution as well and you're interested in, in finding out more about our program, then shoot us an email as well. Also want to thank uh, NACE, who's been hosting us for these streams. If you're interested in, in a career in eSports or if you're a professional gamer, definitely check them out and check out their website. And the Newell as well, who helped us pick uh, our partner institutions, have been really, really helpful. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to you guys watching. And we will catch you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>